start recording. Okay. Um, thank you everybody for um, coming this uh, coming virtually uh, this uh, for this lecture, which actually is the last one for this semester. Um, before we go for the semester break for the academic break, um, and I'm uh, very honored to to host uh, Dr. Natalie uh, Goodkin. Uh, from um, the uh, American Natural Museum. Sorry, I didn't say it right. American Museum of Natural History. <laughs> Natalie Gutman is an oceanographer with interest in changes to ocean circulation, ocean-driven climate, and ocean chemistry. She is an associate curator at the American Museum of Natural History. Dr. Goodkin uses the chemical composition of coral skeletons to improve our understanding of climate change over the past 500 years. After receiving her um, bachelor cum laude in chemistry from Harvard University, Dr. Goodkin worked for Credit Suisse First Boston in their mergers and acquisition group. She received her PhD in chemical oceanography from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute joint program. After which, Dr. Goodkin spent one year at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences and four years at the University of Hong Kong. In 2012, she received a Singapore <clears throat> NRF Research Fellowship and joined the faculty at Nanyang Technological University. When at sea, she is usually the most seasick pe person on the boat. Me too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we host uh, Dr. Natalie Goodkin uh, on a um, talk that is entitled Ocean Circulation on the Maritime Continent. Are we overlooking critical drivers? Natalie, the podium is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, Nicholas, and good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, I really appreciate you coming this morning. Um, I was telling Nicholas earlier, this is my first Zoom science lecture. I've taught a few classes, but it's a different environment, so forgive me if I have any slips along the way. Um, the, uh, okay. The work that I'm going to show you today is um, the sort of summation of almost 10 years of work. And so I by no means did it on my own. Um, and I'm, in specific, there are many other um, people who's, who have worked on this project, but I'm going to be showing data um, generated by Annette Bolton, who was a postdoc in my laboratory, to John Murdy, who was an undergraduate, uh, sorry, was a PhD student in my laboratory, and Rio Ramos, who was also a PhD student. Um, there was, at the end, I have a long list of all the collaborators, but this work was not doable without a large number of people. Um, and we had funding from both um, NRF and um, the Ministry of Education in Singapore. Um, and this involved, you're gonna see the number of sites, an enormous amount of field work over a three year period. So these two little guys spent almost three years um, constantly in and out of the field, um, assisting us, these are my sons. So I just wanna make sure to thank them as well because they. I think it's a lot of school for this endeavor. Uh, so the issue I'm having is it's not, there we go. I've got to get it moving forward quickly. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through why we chose to look at Southeast Asia. We're gonna talk a little bit about the methods and the geochemistry because I saw on your department site, there's a broad range of background. Um, then we're gonna talk about the results and the different parts of the South China Sea and Indonesian coastal areas. Um, and then if we have time, we can look at future plans that it might be tight. Um, so why do we care about the Indo-Pacific region? Um, this was a photo made by Valerie Pierres, and it basically shows that within this circle on the map, there are more people living in the circle than out of it. So this is an incredibly densely populated region that's particularly susceptible to changes um, in climate as a, um, on their, um, on their livelihoods, on their water supply, on their food security. So it becomes really important for us to understand how this system might change. And as you saw on the front picture, um, I worked on corals and there are actually more corals living within this triangle than there are living outside of this triangle. So it's a really interesting intersection for me scientifically of a region where I can look at a societally, societally relevant problem 
um, using the tool I most prefer to use um, to understand what is a really, really complex oceanographic system. Um, the maritime continent or the South China and Indonesian seas area right here. Um, is their belt transfers tropical water from one ocean basin to another. Um, so this, these currents which flow through um, the maritime continent ultimately form the current that um, dips around the southern part of Africa and returns water to the Atlantic Ocean to keep the conveyor belt moving. Um, when this current speeds up or slows down, you're changing the amount of heat exchange that's happening um, between these two ocean basins. And you're also altering the precipitation patterns from um, southeastern China through to India. You're changing the rates of mosquito-borne illness in all of these locations as you change precipitation patterns. The currents are dispersing the larvae of fish and coral. Um, and you're also impacting the salt content between the two ocean basins. So even subtle changes to these currents can have a big impact on a lot of the surface ocean processes that we see in this region. So what do the currents look like um, over here? You have the North Equatorial Current that's moving across the Pacific, and you have the North Equatorial Counter Current, which flows water back towards um, the Americas. Um, and when the North Equatorial Current hits um, the Philippine archipelago, it splits, and it splits into two currents. One of those is the Kuroshio Current, which is a strong western boundary current that brings heat north. You can see um, the coloring on the back, sorry, is sea level height. But if you had a temperature map, it wouldn't look completely dissimilar. And this Kuroshio Current moves north up past Japan, um, delivering heat um, as it goes there as well. When it passes, the Luzon Strait, um, which is between Taiwan and the Philippines, um, some of this water breaks off into what we call the Kuroshio intrusion and brings water into the South China Sea. Um, the southern lobe is the Mindano Current, which flows south past um, the um, Mindano Island of the Philippines. And some flows into this North Equatorial Current and some moves into the Indonesian Sea Flow which is the main path of that water that's moving from the Pacific to the Indian Ocean. Um, and it flows mainly through the Makassar Strait and then breaks off into three branches to exit into the Indian Ocean. Uh, the monsoon winds um, control what happens in the South China Sea portion of um, the circulation. So what you're seeing here is the dominant winds in winter are shown by those sort of greenish blue large arrows. Um, and this is flowing water um, from the northeast towards the southwest. A single gyre forms in the South China Sea. And you have two paths of seawater um, that come through the Sulu Sea um, up north and then the Java Sea to the south and join with the Indonesian blue flow. In the summer, the winds split and you can see that they blow sort of through the Java Sea here, and then from the southwest towards the northeast in the South China Sea. A double gyre forms in the South China Sea, and some water is expected back, um, back through this current, um, through this channel here um, within the Indonesian seas as well. The climate drivers that are impacting the strength and the size of these currents are generally thought to be the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Um, which sets up the patterns of sea surface temperature in the Pacific Ocean and therefore the exact location of these currents. Um, El Nino Southern Oscillation, um, which is a sort of varying of the um, tropical winds and therefore the tropical sea surface temperatures and currents across the Pacific. And the East Asian Monsoon, which are those reversing winds that I just showed you in those two figures where um, depending on the heat difference between the Asian continent and the South China Sea, you have winds uh, reversing um, season. So the key questions that we want to ask ourselves about this region is how has monsoon-driven ocean circulation changed in the past 500 years? How does the monsoon variability impact seawater exchange through the sea space? And has the majority of the variability been in the winter or the summer monsoon? And by looking back over the past 500 years, we hope to have a better understanding of how things might change um, in the next 500 years um, as we've changed um, mean hemispheric climate temperatures. 
So where did we go? I, I told you my kids sacrificed several years of schooling for this endeavor. We went to um, a large number of places. Uh, and um, we're going to look today at the sites that are shown in orange. So Riovi, who I mentioned at the beginning, my student looked at these two sites, a cross of these on straight. Um, Sudhara Murthy was looking at um, several sites in Indonesia, and we're going to look at this site as well. And then we're going to show some data that Nettie and I worked on um, from Vietnam. Um, but we went to several other sites across the region um, where we tried to capture changes um, to the currency time. So how do we do this? Um, our goal with using corals is to get a multi-century record in one archive. So if you think about all the different paleo archives that you can choose from, um, we can get much further back in time, for instance, if we look at foraminifera, but you're lucky to get one average sample per 100 years. Um, with the coral, I, we can get to sub-monthly um, with certain proxies or annually with other proxies. Corals are also stationary over their lifespan, so they sit in one location, so you know what you're reporting. You're still only reporting one location, um, which provides its own challenges, but you know where it's come from. Um, We can because of the density band that are in coral. Um, and in the region I'm working, and really in the region um, where all of you are living, the, they're very easily found as well. Well, I guess Nicholas said you aren't all living there, but where uh, your university is, there's quite a number of coral. So what we do is we, we go to countries and we build collaborations, and then we try to find corals that look like this. This, um, to most people, um, don't describe this as a coral. It's not what um, they normally think of. But this is, in fact, um, a single colony coral. We called it Ponya. It's in Vietnam, and in Vietnamese, Ponya means the big one. Um, it was roughly 500 meters from top to bottom. And we couldn't get the coral. The, the visibility was bad, so we couldn't get the whole coral in a photo. But it's roughly 34 meters in circumference at the base of this coral. So if you look around your room, um, depending on where you are, it's likely that this coral would fit into your room. So it's really quite large. This is Justin Ossolinsky, Os and he's a, about two meters tall. So that gives you a sense of just how big this coral is. Um, this coral is growing for over 400 years. Um, we didn't get quite to the bottom, but it, we got about 420 years worth of growth. We do this by working with a hydraulic drill. Um, so this drill head here is connected up to the top um, to a motor on the boat. Um, and it's, it's run by pressure within those lines and we drill down. Um, there is no permanent damage done. I don't think I have slides on that in this talk, but um, we take just a very small portion of the coral. The living part of the coral is just the very um, outer edges of the coral and we fill it up with a plug and it will grow over um, within a couple of years and continue to live. We pull out a core that looks like this. This one is about 4.8 meters in length. Uh, we're able to slice that core and take an X-ray of it. Um, and the density band gets revealed um, within. So we can count back where one light and one dark band forms a year. And then we break it into small pieces and we sit at a, a drill like this. And we take tiny aliquots of powder to measure for chemistry back to time. Um, Tone Yacht, for instance, so far we've had over 11,500 chemical analyses done on Tone Yacht. So it gives you an idea of how much data we can collect from these samples. Um, the H model is built like this. This is a different coral. This is actually a coral from my PhD thesis in Bermuda, but it's um, a really nice way to illustrate what we do. So slabs were cut from this, um, and we had sort of overlapping time periods to count back through time. Um, and this is a coral from the United States Geological Survey where they've actually superimposed the strontium calcium on top of it. Um, strontium calcium is an indicator of sea surface temperature. And you can see that you can count back where you have a summer, a winter, a summer, a winter, um, back through time to build that age model. Um, possible sources of error within this age model building are corals, uh, years of little or no growth, um, or just visually not being able to see if the coral growth rate gets too low. That's much more typical in Atlantic corals than it is in Pacific corals. 
Um, we cut the annual samples following um, the x-ray using um, a saw usually and sub-annual drill samples that get drilled using these micrometer controlled stages. This is the OB here um, where we can take every quarter of a millimeter of sample back to time. The radiocarbon analysis that I'm going to show you was performed on an accelerator mass spectrometer at the UC Irvine Test Radiocarbon Facility. Oxygen isotopes get measured on a MAC 253 isotope ratio mass spectrometer with a kill device where they're measuring oxygen and carbon isotopes. And the strontium calcium analysis gets measured on the um, ICT OES, the injectively coupled plasma oxygen emission spectrometer, um, which measures how much of uh, trace elements we have relative to calcium. Um, the reason that we look at strontium calcium is um, that we're looking for this relationship to temperature. So this is showing you a, cal uh, a calibration of strontium calcium monthly in the coral versus monthly gridded SST on the x-axis. Um, and you can see that with some noise and air, strontium calcium is reflecting to the surface temperature at the site. Um, the red is a parietes coral and the blue is a diplastria. So you can see that each coral has its own calibration. So while um, this relationship is consistent, it does have a biological imprint on it. And so you have to, calibrate each coral as opposed to just take one relationship and apply it um, to every coral. Um, oxygen isotopes reflect both um, salinity and temperature. So uh, at a lot of the sites in this maritime continent, actually, the oxygen isotope, the salinity signal is much stronger than the temperature signal because you're in tropical waters. Um, but the impacts of the changes to circulation and the monsoon precipitation means that your salinity changes quite largely. So there's two ways that we calibrate oxygen isotopes. One is we remove the temperature signal and then we use the residual to reconstruct salinity. Um, in this region, we often found that that wasn't helpful because the temperature signal introduced more noise. And so you can see that um, in this paper example I'm showing you, Ryobi took the Delorate scene of the coral and she was able to correlate it directly to salinity. So we're able to reconstruct salinity, um, sometimes just using oxygen isotopes and sometimes using a combination of oxygen isotopes and temperature. C14 is a little bit more complicated. Um, C14 production happens primarily in the atmosphere. Um, the atmosphere then mixes and that new C14 gets distributed throughout the planet and it gets absorbed within the ocean. So if we look at this from a sort of box modeling perspective, you've got um, production, natural production in the stratosphere. We've also introduced um, bomb C-14 since the late 1940s. This happens in the stratosphere. It gets mixed into the troposphere, taken up by the biosphere and the surface ocean, and then mixed throughout the ocean over time. The atmospheric mixing is rather quick and your mixing time but the ocean processes are always are quite a bit slower. So if we think about our conveyor belt, we have C14 that's accumulating up here in the atmosphere. It's exchanging with the surface ocean. The surface ocean is flowing to the poles where that water stays. Once the water is removed from the surface ocean, it doesn't pick up any new C14, and the C14 starts to decay through time. So the further you move away from your sources of deep water, the older the water gets or the less C14 it has due to decay. This water then gets mixed back up through the thermocline and into the surface ocean, providing another signal of C14 into the surface ocean. So if you go to any individual site, you can reconstruct the C14 pattern in the surface ocean as a mixture of atmospheric uptake and deep water circulation into um, the surface waters. So to give you a sense of what that looks like, I have this um, latitudinal profile of C14 at depth. And so each point is a measurement and the color is showing you the C14. So the radiocarbon of negative 280 means there's very little radiocarbon, whereas 160 means that there's quite a lot. And what we can see is that the surface waters, this is a post-bomb profile, and the surface waters have a very high C14 but the deeper waters have a very low C14. So as you have mixing across the boundary, you can get another signal of how much water is moving up or down in the water column. 
if we look at the conveyor belt and where we are, right, we're primarily in this region, um, deep water is mainly formed here in the Atlantic um, or in the Northern Atlantic um, up in the Arctic. And so by the time the water is making its way, the deep water in particular, is making its way to the South China Sea, this water is really, really old. So we're able to capitalize on the fact that the profile of the sea floor chain changes very dramatically from the surface to the depth here and look at how um, rates of upwelling have changed through time. There are a lot of other geochemical tools that we use that I'm not gonna talk about today, but may be of interest to some of you and I'd be happy to talk to you about them later. Um, those include C13, which looks at the carbon cycle and core biology. Um, uh, Delta 11B, which is, um, gives us records of pH. We can look at nitrogen and phosphorus to understand biogeochemistry. Um, barium calcium can tell us about circulation and runoff. There's a number of other imaging um, techniques which we're actually publishing about quite a bit um, this year, looking at how changes to um, organic content in the water column um, changes back to time. Uh, so I'll shift now to results, um, and we can start looking at uh, the South China Sea, sort of Indonesian Sea. I'm just going to say I am a person who loves to take questions during a talk, which is really difficult to do within Zoom. But I don't know, Nicholas, if there was like a crisis question where someone was totally lost, I'd be happy to clarify anything. Um, no, I think that for the meanwhile, it's okay. Okay, sounds good. So I'm just um, showing you again maps of this region, this time showing you um, sea surface temperature, um, one in the dry um, or the winter monsoon and the other in the, the wet or the, this is the late summer or the early fall monsoon. And then superimpose our changes to the current, our, the current positions generalized on top. Um, as you can see, there's a range of sea surface temperature, particularly as you get to the north. Um, and less so um, in, in the summertime where the um, seawater is a little bit more homogenized across the whole region. Um, these are at, you know, just average over 30 years, so it's just a generalized um, system of what we have. Um, the next one is a little bit um, more important in terms of the processes we're going to be talking to, but this is the same months, February and October, but we're showing sea surface salinity. So um, you can see that if you're sort of in the more oceanic um, areas in the Indian and Pacific, um, particularly in the fall, the salinity is pretty consistent. But within these seas, you've got a huge range of salinity. Um, and then in the winter, um, the salinities become a bit fresher and you have um, even more changes within the Indonesian um, seas on those salinity rates. And that's, um, partly due to precipitation and partly due to abstraction. Um, so we're gonna start today looking at the sites that I mentioned up here that Rio Z did her thesis between um, the Philippines and Southern Taiwan. Um, so the most important process that happened is happening here is that corrosion intrusion, which I mentioned um, to you at the beginning. And how much of the corrosion intrudes is really dependent on the bifurcation latitude of these two currents, the North Equatorial Current and the Mindano Current. Um, and so we have a record of the bifurcation latitude. Um, and I did not write down where that was from, but the, uh, we have this sort of satellite based record of the um, bifurcation latitude. And um, we took Delta C14 records um, at our two sites and we compared um, them to other sites. So for the bifurcation latitude site, we're looking at the difference between a record from Guam and a record from Northern Luzon. And that's what's shown in red here. And you have El Nino in the gray squares and then that bifurcation latitude in the background. And you can see that the difference between the annual C14 at um, Luzon and the annual C14 at Guam um, coincides very tightly with the bifurcation latitude. And so what we're seeing is that if the bifurcation latitude is higher, these um, have a closer delta C14 signal. Um, and if the bifurcation latitude is lower, they have less similar. And so that's basically telling us that where these currents are moving is shifting whether or not these C14 records look the same or not. So whether they the, the transfer of the 
message from the Equatorial Pacific is reaching to these on straits. The other comparison that we're trying to make is the difference between southern Taiwan and internal in the South China Sea. Because if the Kyushu intrusion is coming in, these two sites should look different. But if it isn't coming in, they should look um, more similar. So the Delta C14 difference between those sites is shown in blue here. And what we found is that what really drove whether these two related to each other was the East Asian winter monsoon. So when you have a really active East Asian winter monsoon, they're more similar. And when you have um, a low activity um, East Asian winter monsoon, they have a larger difference. So this gave us an indication that whether or not um, the water coming into the strait, um, whether there was a lot of water coming into the strait or not, may have been tied to the East Asian winter monsoon. So we built a box model of this um, region where we were looking at C14 production in the atmosphere, um, C14 of the South China Sea, C14 of Kyushu intrusion. Um, we looked at a surface box within the Luzon Strait, and then of course we're looking at that deeper water, which is providing the sig older signal of the C14. Um, and I won't bore you with the sort of details of that model, but the basic idea was that you've got um, a change in C14 in the Luzon Strait due to the atmosphere, the vertical mixing, which comes from shipboard measurements, and from lateral mixing, which we get from uh, coral measurements. Um, and we're able to take some assumptions from within the literature and look um, at changes of rates to production in each of these boxes to understand what the exchange is. And the, the net result is that we're looking at a driver um, which we've called k lat, which is the net inflow into this surface Luzon Strait. So it's a combination of the Kuroshu intrusion and water flowing out from the South China Sea. And we're able from this model to calculate that value and try to get an understanding of what's really driving the rate of exchange through the South China Sea. So we know that um, the bifurcation latitude is really important. So we started out by comparing k lat to El Nino which we found to be the main driver, or which is really known to be the main driver of, um, of the bifurcation latitude. And so what we can find here is that there's a really tight correlation between um, our rate of exchange across this Luzon Strait box and the Almunia Southern Oscillation. And this is the main driver of what's happening. And effectively what we found is that in a very um, strong La Nina year, the bifurcation latitude moves south, and the rate of exchange into the South China Sea is quite a bit smaller. In an El Nina year, the bifurcation latitude moves north, and the crucial intrusion increases. Um, the sort of secondary driver becomes um, what happens when you have a sort of neutral El Nina year. And it's hard to see in this figure, but this was the best we could come up with. But when you have a neutral El Nina year, the main driver of that exchange rate is the East Asian winter monsoon, which is what we were able to sort of piece out when we were looking at Taiwan and inside the South China Sea differences. And so this secondary influence of the East Asian winter monsoon um, was a bit of a surprise and sets up a lot of what we're finding as we move through these straits. Um, so the end conclusions from these sites were that ENSO drives the Kyushu intrusion, um, El Nino increases the intrusion, and La Nina decreases the intrusion, and a weak Asian winter monsoon will slow that intrusion. Um, so now I want to move down to the Indonesian seas, um, which are a little bit more complicated, but much more driven by salinity than anything else. And so we're going to look at salinity, and what you see here is sea surface salinity versus sea surface temperature. This is all gridded SSP and SSS data. This is not coral data. But in the summer, we have mixing between the Banda Sea and the Mindano current um, coming into the Indonesian through flow. And in the winter, we have mixing between the water entering through Yogi site here at the Luzon Strait and water coming from the Java Sea. Um, and you can see that if you're looking particularly at the winter, there's a very large gradient in salinity relative and a relatively small gradient in sea surface temperature. So this is the time frame that we focus on. Um, just a quick reminder of what's happening. The winds are blowing from the northeast towards the southwest, and we have um, water joining the Indonesian through flow from the Luzon Strait and past the Sulu Sea, 
and then from here, um, from the southern South China Sea to the Java Sea. So on the figures I'm going to show you next, there's going to be gridded data from the Luzon Strait and from the South China Sea, and then our coral data from here in the Makassar Strait. So what you can see is that the um, salinity, gridded salinity from Luzon and Java show pretty consistent differences through time um, with some variability, but relatively flat in trend. But the coral data is showing large shifts in whether it looks more like the Luzon or more like the Java Sea. Um, and so we have two regions that we're looking at. One is where um, in the late sort of 1970s until today, where you have a sort of general freshening. And the other is in the 1940s and 50s, where you have this huge shift in salinity from the coral, um, from looking almost entirely like the Luzon Strait to looking like the Java Sea. So if you break these two down into um, the seawater mixing maps, um, you can see that from the 1940s to the 1950s, the coral moves its salinity from looking quite a bit like the Luzon to looking a lot more like the Java Sea. Whereas in the 1970s to the 2000s, the mixing rate stays relatively the same. They're, they're sort of two thirds of the way looking more like Luzon, but we have an overall freshening of both. This signal is um, enzo dependent and it is um, very reflective of salinities overall in this region that they tend to be freshening. But this signal was really quite unexpected. Um, and if we show that same um, data, which is now shown here in this green um, shaded line, and we compare it to the East Asian Winter Monsoon Index, you can see that before 1976, there's an extremely strong correlation between the reconstructed sea surface salinity and the East Asian Winter Monsoon. Um, this is basically showing us that salinity, which should be driven very heavily by the um, Indonesian flu flow, has earlier in time been very dependent on the East Asian winter monsoon. So we had to think about why that might be happening. And um, we found the answer a lot in Arnold Gordon's work. And so what you're seeing here is the sea surface salinity um, of the maritime continent in the winter to so the 30 year average, which I showed you before. And you can see here that the water is really, really fresh um, in the Java Sea. So if we have an increase of flow, um, due to um, the East Asian winter monsoon of this fresh Java seawater into the Makassar Strait. This sits like a plug on the top of the Makassar Strait and it pushes all of the currents, particularly the Indonesia flu flow, further down in the water column, which Arnold always represents by this great stop sign, but of course it's not a complete stop, it's more like a slowdown. So we're looking now at having two impacts with the East Asian winter monsoon. If it's very active, um, and enzo is neutral, it will pull more water into the South China Sea, but it's also going to draw more water from the Java Sea to the Makassar Strait and slow down the flow of the Indonesian through flow um, into the Indian Ocean. So increasingly, the East Asian winter monsoon starts to show up as an important factor in how much water gets moved from the Pacific to the Indian Ocean. Um, so we know that ENSO is driving the Kurosho intrusion with the winter monsoon impacting the intrusion, particularly in slow ENSO years. Um, we know that the ITF from past literature is really driven by the PDO and ENSO, um, but we're starting to see an increasing impact in the monsoon, particularly in the winter, in terms of the baseline exchange of that water all the way through to the Indian Ocean. The next question becomes, well, what are these monsoons doing? Um, back to time. And so for that, we're turning to um, the Vietnam coral to look at how that um, is changing back to time. So Vietnam is um, sits on a sort of sharp um, edge of uh, topography into the deeper basin of the South China Sea. And so these monsoon winds that we've been talking about um, actually lead to upwelling and downwelling. So in um, the summer, when the winds are blowing um, from the southwest to the northeast, um, the Coriolis force in, interacts with it to get upwelling at the site. So we get really low C14 values in the surface water drawn up. In the winter, those winds reverse and the Coriolis force combines to make the water crash into the Vietnam coast and we have a downwelling signal. So we can capitalize on what will be a really large range of C14 through time based on the direction and strength of these winds to reconstruct 
um, how the monastery has changed back through time. And um, this is a record of um, C14 characterizing the summer monsoon from 1600 to today. And this is a record on the right side of the winter monsoon from 1600 to today. And um, what you can see is that both of these monsoons were quite a bit more active in the 1600s, which was when the Northern Hemisphere was generally very cold, it's a little ice age. Um, they then both had less variability and then became more active again in the late 1700s and then declined sort of approaching to 1950. Um, what's driving those um, changes in variability is interesting. In the summer, we get pretty much what we would have expected which is that the Asian um, surface temperature um, and ENZO are reasonably coupled and are showing an inverse relationship with variability in the summer monsoon. Um, this is sort of climatically an expected response. The winter is a bit different. Um, so the winter monsoon variability here is shown in orange and you have the Siberian high, which is a measure of the temperature gradient that drives the monsoon in blue and ENZO shown in green. And the interesting thing is that at different frequencies, the Siberian high has a different relationship. What we see in the modern record is that if you have a high Siberian high, you have a high winter monsoon. Um, and the long-term trend agrees with this, but there's this multi-decadal variability um, where they're actually opposite one another. We're seeing this also in a, um, a different record of the monsoon that I won't show today. Um, but the connection seems to be that ENZO is feeding back on these two systems in a different way than expected, where you would have, um, you have ENZO positively coupled to the Siberian high, but inversely coupled to the winter monsoon. So this changed a little bit how we understood what might drive monsoon variability and therefore drive the variability in these two straits. So we turned to the temperature record and um, we're about to submit this paper, but uh, what you're seeing in orange here is the, um, the wet season or the summer monsoon SSP record. Um, and this is with a hundred year smooth. So we're looking at this low frequency variability where we're not seeing what we expected. And this is the winter SSP record um, from these sites. And um, what you can see is that um, at 1900, so before 1900, these two temperature signals from the Vietnam coral are very tightly correlated. And then around 1900, their relationship falls apart. So we plotted the difference between the wet season and the dry season down below here. And you can see that it's pretty constant at you know about 0.8 degrees Celsius through time. And then starting in 1900, when we have this large anthropogenic impact, um, to 1950, it almost doubles to one point six degrees Celsius. So these two seasons, which always behave the same, are now behaving very differently. And this black line here is just showing you the northern hemisphere sea surface temperature um, average. So you can see that it it accelerates around the same time. Um, and so uh, we're I did not put this figure in at the last minute, but what we're finding in this record is that in this decoupling, we may see very different behavior in the winter monsoon in the future than we had in the past. Um, and a lot of that is tightly tied to heat exchange across the Luzon Strait. And so how these waters are exchanging through this area is gonna have a large impact on SSP and on the behavior of the East Asian winter monsoon, which we've seen further downstream can cause um, big changes in Indonesian through flow or that exchange from the Indian and the Pacific. So um, just to conclude, and I think I'm pretty good on time, these densely populated, heavily monsoon dependent populations are relying on a system with large scale color connections. And so when we perturb the system, it's gonna be really difficult to understand the outcome. So we're looking back through time to try to understand this. And the main thing that we're finding is that the Indonesian, I'm sorry, the East Asian winter monsoon um, is a, an important secondary driver of flow um, into the South China Sea and flow out of the Indonesian Straits and into the Indian Ocean. Um, so we need to start to understand this system better because the um, impacts on global circulation are becoming more clear. And um, with that, I'll tell you that the most important lesson I ever learned was right here in Taiwan, and that is that corals cannot, snorkel, cars cannot snorkel. So do not drive your car into the water. 
Um, and I'll just put up a list of acknowledgements and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Natalie. It was really interesting. Thank you. Uh, you virtually took us to a beautiful area in the planet with a beautiful study. Thank you. So I, uh, it's difficult for, for us to see all the faces. So just uh, whoever has a question, just step in. Um, Somebody, another question? Okay. Hey. Itzik, go ahead. I have some questions which are a bit general. The confinement of the South Asia, Asia Sea, how shallow are, they, are those water passages? Um, so that's actually, we go way back to the beginning. Um, this is the largest continental shelf on the planet. Um, so uh, I guess that's not a great one, but um, I don't think, yeah, I don't think that well would be here. Um, just, uh, so this sort of lighter blue is generally um, Share again. Yeah, again. yeah yes. I got it. So sorry. Not bad for the first technical difficulty. Yeah. Okay, do you see it now? Yep. Okay. So this sort of light blue area is typically um, less than 80 meters, 100 meters. Um, and then the depths here in the South China Sea and um, I'm blanking on this sea's name, but up here and then down in the Banda Sea can be 2,500, 3,000 meters. Um, so the shelves are quite shallow. And then what is going on with the deep water? You were talking about a surface exchange, mm -hmm. but uh, you were completely describing a system of surface exchange with, uh, with no, uh, it so, wasn't clear to me how they interact with deeper water within this South China Sea. Okay, so both um, up here in the Luzon Strait, you can see that the water depths get quite large. Um, and also here off the coast of Vietnam, we were sort of right on the edge of this platform. Um, the depths get deep. So you have deeper waters there well below the thermocline. And um, you have... Um, in the, this area, you've got sharp currents, which are leading to upwelling and downwelling of the water um, at this site. And then over in Vietnam, you've got wind-driven upwelling and downwelling. So the C-14 gets mixed up when there's upwelling, and that's that really low C-14. Um, and then in downwelling, you're, you're just sort of trapping the surface water at that site, so you get much higher C-14 value. Does that answer the question? So, so the upwelling is happening on the on the west side and uh, downwelling on the east side, or vice versa. It reverses because the winds reverse, so it seasonally reverses. It's it's not dissimilar to what happens in the Arabian Sea with upwelling and downwelling. Okay, it's a very complex system. It's an extremely complex system and really hard to do in a in a short talk from a distance. But Natalie, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, with the resolution of the corals that you are studying, do you see some kind of um, signal for uh, anthropogenic influence? I mean, um, the industrial revolution or similar. Um, the, the answer is yes, and, and the question becomes what, what signal do you see? So, I mean, there's um, a paper in radiocarbon that, you know, the C14, yes, we see the bomb C14 at all of these sites very, very clearly. Um, we, you can see the introduction of leaded gasoline at all of these sites very, very clearly. Um, the... Vietnam record is really the record that's long enough to see 
the big changes between um, present day and sort of a pre a pre industrial revolution site. And it's interesting because we're we're we have a paper um, in in press or in um, preparation right now looking at nitrogen isotopes from this site, and you definitely see the impact of the introduction of nitrogen um, through industrial processes and. Um, we see uh, at, at Vietnam, we also see this gasoline signal that goes on well after leaded gasoline was removed, which is actually an ocean circulation signal. It's, it's being evicted in the deeper water back to the site. Um, but I think the biggest, the biggest anthropogenic signal we've found is actually this one where there's this deep coupling of this seasonal temperature. Um, and looking at the general circulation models, which is the figure I had meant to put in, um, it's, it's a, in the end, it's actually a heat advection signal. And so it's a change in how much heat is being transported across the Luzon Strait to the South China Sea, which is changing in the, um, the wet season, but not changing in the dry season. And that's because the East Asian winter monsoon is sort of regulating that heat transport in the winter. But in the summer where it's just um, very, very dependent on ENZO, we're not seeing, you know, we're seeing this very large anthropogenic impact. Um, but it doesn't show up as warming temperatures because any site that I'm going to, we're choosing that site because it has a very complex oceanography where I can capitalize on the chemistry to get at a mixing signal. But once you have a mixing signal, you're not seeing that dominant, the temperatures rising. If you went to one of the sites where it's just surface water and no complex oceanography, you'd start to see that anthropogenic signal in the temperature much more strongly. Yeah, actually, I got the the idea of the question where you show this this slide. Actually, um, so I was wondering really if you can decouple the anthropogenic impact. And do you see that decoupling in many of the coral reefs or in a specific region? Um, this is the first place we've seen the, the enormous decoupling that's just so very evident. And it's evident, this is a hundred year smooth, but it's very evident that all time scales quite frankly. Um, and I guess it was almost more surprising that they were so tightly coupled than that they are not coupled anymore. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, what does that mean in terms of precipitation? What does that mean in terms of, um, you know, changes to, to crop production? You know, that's beyond my scope, but I think that it's a huge impact on what we're going to see uh, going forward. Okay, thank you. Somebody has a question? I don't, yeah. How do they, how do you think are the rivers affecting, yeah. uh, affecting your signal? Um, a lot. So in Vietnam, uh, we've spent an enormous amount of time demonstrating that they're not affecting the signal. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, the, the same is really true in, in Taiwan and Luzon, that there's the, the corals are just positioned in such a way that the rivers aren't impacting those, those corals individually. And I would say the same thing down here, that a river is not impacting any of these corals. If they were, we wouldn't be getting oceanographic signals. But the rivers in general are what's driving this salinity, um, this very, very fresh salinity um, in the the Java Sea here, and particularly this is water flowing off of um, primarily Borneo. So you can see this sort of Borneo river plume here. Um, and we have a, a coral from this site actually, which is absolutely tracing river runoff through barium. Um, and we're seeing similar in this, the coral sites that are around this um, peninsula here. Um, but what's interesting is that the there's so much rainwater and there's so much runoff from the peat bogs and everything into the sea that you're actually changing the total salinity of that surface water, which um, happens every year and is, gives us the ability to trace that water through the mixing process. 
inside the China Sea in the in the in the north northwestern part from China. So um, the, we have. And, and I'm talking about the the impact, not on the coral, not the direct, the, the oceanographic impacts. Yeah. So we have corals from Hong Kong um, that you can definitely see the Pearl River, but the Pearl River impacts are are you know you can tell from this map the Pearl River impacts are not that large um, because the the volume relative to the volume of the South China Sea they get diluted reasonably quickly. Um, that's not the case in this large coastal zone where you've got this, that really large shallow water area that you and I were talking about earlier. Um, and here you can see changes to the river and the, um, the, the main proxy we use to understand how river flow has changed is barium and then um, the amount of organic matter which we can image in the coral through UV. Um, and you can trace back sort of large changes through time um, the longest record we have is that Vietnam record and the, uh, the, the river gloriously doesn't impact it because we didn't really want to be looking at the river there. Um, but around this region, you can get changes to river runoff through time. And um, we're, we've been developing those proxies so the really long records don't exist yet, but they are coming. Okay. More questions? Well, if so, there are no questions. I would like to thank you again, Natalie. Thank you for inviting me, Nicholas. It was, it was really, really enlightening. And the if if the um, mail works correctly, it should, a little bit slow these days with the corona pandemic, but eventually you will get a um, um, letter from us, it's here. <laughs> Thank you. So you will get it with a present from us, okay? That Thank you very much. I hope that you will, you will like. And if you would like to stay tuned with our seminars, just tell me and I will add you to the seminar list. Okay, great. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank for everybody, you we thank you very much, really. And for everybody, all the students of the department, we go for a break with um, the semester break and we will meet um, in a month, I think, with a long seminar list that includes, um, again, United States, Norway, UK, Canada, Germany and so on and so on. So stay tuned. Okay. Thank you, Natalie. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's an incredible resolution of data. It's just so astonishing. Thank you. Overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> it's overwhelming as part of its problem. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Have a good day over there. Thank you too. Thank you. Bye bye.